Hi, Barbara. Glad you rejoined us, Barbara. I'm glad everyone's been on this roller coaster with me of will we hold in person programs or will we hold it virtually. And um, I think as long as everybody remains flexible, you know, you'll get some good out of it. Uh, we had hoped to have this program in the library, but, uh, you know, this way we reach more people, I think and uh, get this good information. So uh, if you have any questions about ongoing programming, uh, do check our website. We keep an updated calendar. And uh, I think the decisions about February programming are being made this week. So that's good. We'll know whether we're gonna have like book group or movies and things like that. As I mentioned in the chat, um, this session will be recorded. So if you want to share it with uh, other people, teachers, students, people, retirees, whoever, um, this will probably go up on the Hoover Library's YouTube channel later in the week. And I will be emailing you a handout that includes everything that Amy's going to speak about today. That way you don't have to rush and keep notes. Um, that handout will have hyperlinks in it so we could get right to some of uh, the things she's going to talk about tonight. And uh, we've got a good number of people here. Thank you so much for taking time out of your evening. Um, this is something that's been near and dear to my heart for quite a long time. Actually, I didn't even know it existed before I heard a talk by um, Sarah Parkak at UAB. And uh, I'm sure Amy's gonna go into that later, but I found out that there were these, these projects out there that everybody can participate in and be active in ongoing science and research. I found that fascinating. I had always heard of like Audubon's bird count, things like that, but I didn't know that in and of itself was citizen science. So um, Amy uh, has been a friend for many, many, many years. And, um, and I knew as a science educator, this was something that was also near and dear to her heart too. So we put together this, this evening tonight to give you an introduction to citizen science. And Amy, has a, a, a background that follows, falls great into this. She has a, a BS in ecology from Tulane. 
and a BA uh, from UAB, UAB or UA? Ooh, did I get that right? Uh, from UA. UA. That's right. It's from Alabama. Yeah. 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 In Tuscaloosa. And, and she's done a lot of environmental education, but also a lot of teaching, all ages. Um, you know, a lot in environmental, but just great teacher. I know. Um, I've been the recipient of some of her talks in uh, on the river, and uh, we've enjoyed uh, time on the river together. So I know tonight will be beneficial. And like I said, it will be recorded. I'll send email out a uh, handout. Um, and I hope you enjoy, Amy. Amy, you want to join us and let's talk citizen science. All right. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So just give me a, a minute to do that. Okay. All right. Well, Doris and her husband <clears throat> were in their backyard one day digging a garden. It was late fall and they were getting it prepared for the following spring. And it was the mid 1950s in Indiana. Um, Doris saw a strange looking rock. It was bright white and she reached down and picked it up and it was rough and bumpy on one side. And she turned it over in her hand and looked at it. And her husband said, what is that? Can I look at it? And she handed it to him. And he said, you know what this is? And she said, no. He said, this is a fossil. <clears throat> and that was very exciting to that couple. So they took out to the creek and they went fossil hunting and it became a lifelong passion for both of them. Um, it became a hobby that they did for years and years. And Doris said, you know, it's not just finding the fossils, it's the experience. The, the fun is in the hunt for the fossils. Okay, now at this point, I would love to tell you that Doris became a famous paleontologist and broke all kinds of gender barriers in the 1950s, but I can't. She just remained an ordinary citizen, um, like most of us here. And, uh, you know, and her family thought that was great because they loved her. Okay. Oh, sorry, there's the picture of the fossil. Um, all right, so we're gonna flash forward about 60 years. Okay, Sarah Parkak that Shannon mentioned. If you don't know her, she's a professor of archeology span right here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, she's become known for using satellite images to identify potential archaeological sites. She started off studying Egypt and said Egypt is like looking at a big beach. And really what you need to do is find the patterns in the sand. So she went to satellite photos and started looking for uh, different sites to explore. Now in her work, she had seen lots of looted sites and um, those really hurt her heart. She, and she says, where the ground is strewn with human remains, mummy wrappings, and recently broken pottery, I know we have lost part of history forever. Each bone, each piece of mummy comes from a living, breathing, laughing, loving human being, no different from you and me. How would you feel if the final resting place of your loved ones were treated like this? Well, in uh, 2012, she was invited to give a TED talk on her space archaeology. And in 2016, she won the TED Prize, you know, where select individuals are invited to give a talk and make a wish about how they would change the world. And they're given the money to make that happen. Well, Sarah's wish was for people to help discover the millions of archaeological sites around the world by creating a 21st century army of global explorers to find and protect the world's hidden heritage, which contains clues to humankind's collective resilience and creativity. But in order to get participants, Sarah had to convince the world why archaeology mattered. 
So she announced the creation of the citizen science platform, globalexplore.org. And she invited the world to assist her with her work. She said, the greatest story ever told is the story of our shared history, our shared human journey. But the only way that we're gonna be able to write it is if we do it together. So the resulting online crowdsourcing platform, Global Explore, allows anyone in the world to help map ancient sites by looking at satellite imagery. Okay, so we're gonna to return to Doris for a minute because at this point she's 90, she's living in Cleveland and she wanted something to do. She felt like this would be something useful and she also said she felt like this might help jog her brain a little. So she accepted Sarah's challenge. So Doris, uh, she joined Global Explore when it launched in 2017. And from her armchair, she searched 50,200 pictures of sections of the earth that represented 300 square meters each. And that was with the uh, Global Explorers Expedition, I'm sorry, Expedition Peru. <clears throat> so the Peru project wrapped up in 2019. They had at the end 70,000 volunteers from over a hundred countries, having viewed more than 14 million pictures um, of those uh, 300 square meters. And they identified a collective 19,084 features of archeological interest. Okay, so now these sites that are filmed by Doris and thousands of amateur archeologists, they're being shared with the local archeologists in Peru and government officials there who are checking them all out in person. Um, one of the officials that they're working with is the one that's designated for antiquities. And so they can really uh, strongly protect those sites from looting and give themselves time to be able to come in and uh, find out the story behind them. So one thing that Sarah had said was that there really aren't enough of us scientists. We've got to give more people opportunities to become explorers. And um, Doris says, even at my age, I can continue to hunt for lost civilizations. All right, so the next, um, Peru is wrapped up and the next uh, area that they're going to explore is India. And I feel that should be coming out pretty soon. I think COVID has delayed it a little bit, but it's something I'm excited to see what, the, what they do there next. <clears throat> so this brings up the point that a couple of centuries ago, scientists were people who thought about our world and wrote about it to explain how things are the way they are. Most of them were rich enough that they could study science in their free time since doing science didn't provide an income. So these gentlemen scientists, uh, they formed communities so they could talk over their ideas with each other. Then in the 19th century, um, full-time career scientists became a thing because that's when governments and universities started paying people to do science. So the idea of a professional scientist was born and that contrasted with an amateur scientist, which just didn't have the formal training. Uh, the amateurs didn't earn a lot of respect in their fields and they couldn't really do research or publish anymore like they used to. But in the last couple of decades, things have really changed. And there's a lot more collaboration between the professionals and the amateurs. Um, in the mid 1990s, the word citizen scientist was used to describe people who didn't have formal scientific training, but they volunteered their time to help with scientific research. Now, some kinds of work are really ideal for this, as you'll see in a few minutes, because they don't require extensive training, just a lot of enthusiasm, and sometimes lots of patience. <clears throat> like the volunteers at the Nurdle Patrol. Okay, so a Nurdle is a small plastic pellet. It's the raw material for everything that we make that's, that's made out of plastic. So 
these little bits are made. They're shipped all over the world to factories that then melt them down and make them into all the different plastic products that we use every day. The problem is when they're being loaded onto the trucks or rail cars or ships, some of them spill out on the ground. And even during transportation, they can fly out. And then they wash up on our beaches and you find them in our streams. Now that becomes a real problem when animals think they're a food source, like they're fish eggs or maybe seeds or something that they ought to be eating, but there's really no nutritional value to them. They can clog up the intestinal tracts of the animals. They make them feel full so they don't get hungry and they the animals can starve to death. So a couple of guys started wondering, where are the currents and the winds taking these nurdles? You know, hurricanes take everything on the water, everything in the land, and just kind of move it all around. And so they were wondering, um, what are the places being impacted by these nurdles? Is there anywhere that doesn't have them? So they did what any good scientist would do and they set out on an epic road trip. They looked for nurdles along the beaches of the Gulf Coast from Texas all the way to Florida. They taught people along the way what a nurdle is and how to look for them. And then they developed a database that they put online so volunteers could enter their data. The nurdle control expanded to a, encompass all of North America. And now they have a global following. They use this data to work with companies and regulatory agencies to eliminate nurdles from our waterways. In fact, a lawsuit in 2020 by Texas residents resulted in a 50 million settlement and Formosa Plastics agreed to um, zero pellet loss. And so this money is helping to fund projects like Nurdle Patrol and to help the cleanup of Cox Creek, which is near the plastic plant. And so that's the beauty of citizen science is that anyone can participate in it. School kids, educators, people with an interest in science, but they chose a different career. Video game fans, I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Um, retirees environmental justice advocates, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, and anyone interested in science can help experts with their research projects in a hands-on and really useful way. In fact, there's even a Girl Scout badge associated with the Nurdles. Um, this patch was created by a girl in middle school that uh, she's in California and it was part of her silver award she worked with the Nurdle Patrol and some people overseas in England to come up with criteria for earning this patch. So if you want more information about how to earn the patch, you can drop her email at this address seen right down here in blue, if y'all can see the cursor on my computer. And also it will be in the handout that Shannon spoke about earlier that um, will be made available. So. If you're rushing to get a pin, it's okay, I got you. All right. Now, speaking of Girl Scouts, all right, SciStarter is one of the online websites where you can find out about the citizen scientist projects. And I'll tell you more about the others in a minute. But SciStarter partnered with Girl Scouts and put together a list of great projects for Girl Scout citizen scientists. So you can go to their website and you can search for a specific topic or age group or location, or you can just browse through the list. All right, so even video game fans have become citizen scientists. And this is NASA's NemoNet. And they let you help map coral reefs by coloring in certain areas. So if you're a fan of like the digital coloring books, then this one is for you. Okay. Um, now the problem is that computers 
have a difficult time detecting subtle variations between things, but human eyes are really great at it. So while you play this game, you're teaching the computer, or you're teaching a supercomputer how to do this work itself. Okay, hopefully, eventually the supercomputer can take over the work. We'll see how that goes. Now, currently NemoNet is only available on Apple devices, but there is software in development right now to expand that. All right, here's another fun one. Um, Oceans Net, uh, Ocean Networks Canada has been getting help from citizen scientists. They have cameras installed across their subsea network. So all of this video needs to be studied, but their software has not yet become sophisticated enough to automatically identify a, a whole bunch of different stuff. And so that's why the video needs to be reviewed by human eyes. But they have so many cameras and so many hours of video that it makes it hard for just the scientists to sit there and watch it all day. I mean, this is what a grad student's for, right? Okay, um, or we can get citizen scientists to help. So they made their interface look like you're below water in a submersible and you watch a, uh, like a 15 minute video clip. And then when you spot something of interest, you click on the screen, wherever it is, and then you just kind of make a note of it using the controls at the bottom. And as you watch these video clips, you earn these special creature feature cards that are kind of like baseball cards, but with underwater animals on them. All right, biomedical research easily lends itself to citizen science video games. So here's a few of the more popular ones. Um, an iWire, you have, um, you map the retinal neurons in the brains of mice. And I'm not really sure how to say this. Eterna, it has the RNA in the name and you help advance medical research by solving problems with RNA. Um, and Philo, you help researchers um, learn more about genetic disease. And then in Fold It, you get to play with how proteins are folded. All right. So the GLOBE program, it's building a worldwide community of students and teachers and scientists and citizens. And they're doing real world research. Like you get out and you get your hands dirty and, and you know, so you're not just at the computer playing a game, all right? And because of the, the data that's been collected around the globe, then um, there have been a lot of scientific discoveries, which is really exciting. Now, they have a multitude of projects. And if you are a teacher, then it is worth your time to take a deeper dive into this website. One of my favorites from that website is called uh, Cloud Gazer. All right. And right now through um, February 15th, their cloud challenge is taking place. All right. Now, one of the fun things about this, it's kind of like a hybrid program. You can be outdoors with it or you could do it inside. All right. Now, their thing is satellites are really great, but um, they're not perfect. And the more details they have of cloud cover and cloud types from the ground looking up, then the better they can study the atmosphere. Because right now, satellites just capture the, um, the top down view of our planet. And they give us a big picture of the effects that clouds have on like the climate but they struggle at times to provide detailed analysis of what's happening in specific areas. Like for example, um, it can be challenging to determine how cloud cover is affecting local weather patterns or whether a particular area is receiving more or less precipitation over time. Okay, so these observations from the ground really complement what the satellites cannot see. All right, so here's how the outdoors part of this project works. You download the Globe Observer app on your phone over here on our left. 
and then you click on the clouds. Now, these other ones, mosquito, land covered trees, those are some of the other projects they have. But for the clouds, you click on the clouds and then you're taken to the screen that is in the middle of our page and you would just click on new cloud observation. And then it asks you a couple of things about the date and the time and your location. And it takes you to a really handy tutorial that has lots of really great pictures that just walks you through every step that you need to do. So with the help of the tutorial, you take a photo with your phone's camera in each of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, as well as up and down. And you're like, why down? There's no clouds there, right? But it lets them see like what kind of shadows are on the ground from the clouds. All right, and then you just upload the photos in the app and you're done. All right, and then you have the indoor component of this where people help classify the clouds and the percent coverage of the sky that those clouds take up. Um, so this part of it will last far beyond February. It goes year round. Um, and it's just as easy. They have a little quick tutorial that helps you look at how much of the sky is covered by clouds. And then you just click on how much you think the sky is covered. And to me, it's kind of fun because then you get to see pictures of the sky from other parts of the world. Um, it's just kind of neat, but it's just easy peasy. All right, now as a biologist, I like to spend my time outside in nature. Um, so observing the life cycles of plants and animals with nature's notebook is easy and fun. And you discover so much more about the plants and animals you see every day. Now, this kind of crowdsourced research helps us to understand seasonal change. So here's how it works. You sign up to observe one or more species in your yard and, um, or you know, another place that you frequent, it doesn't have to be your yard. Then you spend time in nature observing the things around you and you use the smartphone app to send in your observations, or you can fill out a paper data sheet and submit those online when you get back home. All right, with so many great citizen science projects out there, it's been really hard to narrow down which ones to tell you all about tonight. Um, so I just wanted to mention a few more of my favorites that are the hands-on projects. Uh, for example, iNaturalist. Uh, with iNaturalist, you take and submit pictures of living things like plants and animals, maybe lichen or slime mold or whatever you see. Um, and the fun part is that the iNaturalist community of, of citizen scientists will help you identify what it is that you saw. If, if you don't know, I mean, maybe you already know. But um, so it's really neat. Like when I see a bird, I don't know, I'll try and get a picture of it with my cell phone and I can upload it to iNaturalist and someone will come back with an answer of what it is. Now, very similar is uh, eBird with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So it's, um, but it's, it's slant is just birds. All right, and another one I wanted to mention is Alabama Water Watch. It's a program local to Alabama and it trains volunteers to test the water chemistry at their local streams and lakes. So the effort these volunteers give to the project, even just an hour or two a month, provides a wealth of data about the aquatic ecosystems of the state that would be very difficult for scientists to go out and collect by themselves. So these are some of my favorite citizen science projects. And I recognize that a lot of them have a slant towards biology. But I assure you that there are also plenty of other projects that have more of a slant towards chemistry or physics or engineering or geology, any other branch of science you can think of. So you might wonder, where do I go to find out more about citizen science projects? And you're lucky that there are several different websites that are kind of like 
a clearinghouse or maybe just a collection spot for citizen science projects. And I have some on the screen. These are also going to be in the handout that Shannon mentioned. And um, so you don't have to scramble to write them down right now. But I just want to mention the massive collaborations that can occur through citizen science allow investigations at a continental and a global scale that, that spans decades. Um, it leads to discoveries that a single scientist could never do on their own. And also the really cool thing about citizen science for me personally, like if you've ever worried about the environment, disease, changes that are going on in, in our planet, that we seem to have very little control over individually, then participating in a citizen science project is a way to be empowered. Um, it makes you part of the solution. And for, with that, I want to just encourage everybody to go and make a difference in the world. Thanks. I I um, also, you know, the applications for the, the uses of these projects, I can see are, assen are essential too during a pandemic because uh, there are, you know, not everybody can get outside, but they can join things like this. Um, it's great for uh, keeping the mind agile. If you're worried about anything like memory loss, dementia, all of those things, um, setting someone, you know, your, your loved ones up with a, you know, a way to do this is something that will keep them active. Um, and, you know, going outside into nature one-on-one -on -one is possible during the pandemic. So finding projects, like you said, like water watch or bird counts, things like that, you can do individually without being in a classroom or whatever. I see a lot of potential for, like you said, for, um, Girl Scouts, but also, you know, Eagle Scouts or even students in inner city who struggle with science. If you Absolutely. Give, yeah, if you give them a fun uh, access to gaming, like they, they, they're obsessed with at home. They One of the things I love about the Cloud Explorer is that everybody has a little bit of sky. You may not have trees in your yard. You may have just concrete and weeds, but there's some sky there. Everybody can participate in that. Yeah, and um, I know my husband Randy. He's he's on the boat here, and uh, you know he he's doing the iNaturalist and in in putting bugs. You know that's his specialty. So I know there's something for everyone. Like you said, engineering you could find projects. I bet one of the best ways is just Google citizen science and whatever you're interested in. You, you know, yeah, you, you could do that. One of the problems I had with just Googling citizen science was that there were so many news articles about it that came yeah. up. There was a lot to sift through, um, which is why I wanted to share with people some of the websites where they can find projects. Yeah, yeah. And but, um, Another one of the fun things is that looking through some of the websites, I find a lot of inspiration of, you know, what could be a possible science fair project. Oh, like, good point. Oh, look at that. Ooh, that's a great idea for a science fair project. Even if you just do something locally, you know, yeah. or you could still collaborate with the people um, doing the project, but some really great ideas out there. Yeah, this is great inspiration and fodder for educators inventors you know anybody who who like you said may not have been able to become a scientist and they became a banker or a house cleaner or whatever you can you can become involved in, in your spare time if you have it <laughs> right that's a good point because you know when i was a kid i loved playing basketball in the driveway with my sister and no one ever thought that we were going to become professional athletes and 
I also love doing art, but no one ever expected me to become a professional artist, and yet I can still enjoy art. But science, you know, if, if there's a kid interested in science for a long time, it was like, oh, you're exploring the creek. You must be interested in science. You'll, you can be a scientist. And that was the only opportunity to enjoy science later in life. There was yeah. no really hobbyist that, that did that. So I really like this because the hobbyist, the, the hobbyist scientist can contribute to the world, make a difference. And in, throughout history, a lot of the, the major concepts of science were done by, like you said, gentlemen scientists who would all get in a room, you know, probably smoking their cigars and cigarettes and, you know, drinking alcohol, but they were like talking about science. And this is the same concept without the cigars and the alcohol, <laughs> getting together with other people and sharing science. Um, let's take, does anybody have any questions? Um, I really am, as you could see, I'm a, a little obsessed with this concept and this idea, um, especially for teachers. Anyone have a, a question? Turn it to the gallery. All right. No active questions. You can also put it in the chat. But um, I'm really fascinated by this. And it, it, so were you able to ascertain is Sarah Parkak, like you said, Peru is over with. Is there other Global Explorer project she's working on? Right. So what they want to do with the Global Explorer is make sure that the area where they go next, um, any area that they ever go to, they want to have the government involved with it. Um, people that can enforce the uh, protection against looting and people that would able to be uh, able to, to do some archeological digs there. So obviously anywhere that is a war zone would be out right away. Um, and so that's why Peru is the perfect place to pick for their first spot. Their next spot is gonna be India and I've heard that it's gonna expand the amount of area that they are searching um, so much more. So I know it had been slated to get started in 2020. Um, I expect they've run into some issues with COVID, especially it being you know, an international effort. So I'm just um, waiting for, for uh, news that they're moving forward with that. Right. Right. And um, yes. Okay. How can you share this session? Well, we're recording now and uh, we will have the full recording of the whole talk um, by the end of the week on Hoover's uh, YouTube channel. So if you go to the YouTube, the YouTube channel that ages me, huh? If you go to the YouTube channel and search Hoover Library, um, a lot of the programs that I've held are there. Um, everything from bird watching to, uh, you know, uh, trying to, we had a Lunar New Year program last year. We have lots of programs uh, archived there. A really uh, good one on Alabama biodiversity with yes. Scott Duncan. Yes, mm -hmm. Scott Duncan did a wonderful job on Alabama biodiversity. Um, we did one on the Cahaba lilies. Uh, a lot of these are archived on our YouTube channel. And that's something that I think has good has come out of the pandemic is that a lot of things that you may see a flyer for and can't go to, now there's a possibility that if it's done with a school, a library or whatever, recording it and putting it out on social media. Um, so you're welcome to use that uh, with your daughter's earth and space science teacher. Um, any other questions? And if not, we will, uh, oh yes. And uh, I do have a great talk from June Ebersol who talked about the Megalodon research going on in Alabama. He's at McWayne Science Center. So um, if you have any questions, I'm gonna uh, include my email address and if Amy uh, agrees, we'll include Amy's. Um, and, you know, I just, 
hope I think I think it would be great for a public libraries around the area to have like teen science clubs and like the whole team get together and do citizen science projects like like you know during the summer they're going to do you know the the INAC going to do something with iNaturalist or the next two months they're going to study clouds and you know it'd be fun science. Yes, that reminds me of something I was going to ask you about, because in looking around at citizen science projects, I've noticed that a lot of libraries are starting citizen science packets that they loan out to people with various stuff in them that they need to carry out research. That's and I was wondering if the idea. Hoover Library is interested in something like that. That's a fantastic idea. I do know, um, for instance, that, oh gosh, am I going to get it wrong? Homewood Library checks out um, telescopes. Um, oh, nice. And some of our area libraries have uh, things like that you could check out. I know uh, Avondale checks out ukuleles, nothing to do with citizen science, but it's unique. Um, but yeah, that'd be a great idea to put together citizen science packets. That'd be great, yeah. And, uh, you know, keep the suggestions coming and uh, keep it tabs of the Hoover Library's calendar because as you know, things are changing. You know, one week we may be in person and the next week we may have to go virtual. So be flexible and enjoy your time with your family, stay safe. And uh, thank you so much for participating in our citizen science talk. I hope it inspires you guys. Thank you, Amy, so much. Thanks for having me. All righty. Take care.